Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed Benhawi, uh, admin of Egyptian ENT Forum. Uh, and that's uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Mustafa. Hello. Hello, Mustafa. everyone. Hello, Mohammed. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor for me to represent the team of admins tonight in our broadcast. Uh, we are really proud of your contribution and commitment to our lectures. Uh, we have Dr. tried Mustafa? our best. Hello? Your camera is not working, I think. Yeah, your camera is not working. She kind of fresh. Yeah, it's working now. Can I see me now? Yeah, it's, uh, everything is okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, let us welcome our professor, and you can introduce him. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a great honor for me to represent the team of admins of the group today uh, in our uh, lecture. Uh, and it's really a great honor to present uh, uh, Professor Amin Javer as well as our speaker for tonight. Uh, Professor Amin Javer is a very well-known rhinologist all over the world, and uh, he has contributed so much to the research in the rhinology world uh, with over 80 peer-reviewed uh, articles uh, in research. Uh, he's also uh, a very well-known surgeon in frontal sinus surgery, and he has recently produced the frontal sinus surgery classification uh, welcome, Professor Jiver, and the uh, entertainment is guaranteed, I believe, tonight. <laughs> Hello, our professor. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mustafa and Mohammed, for having me. I really appreciate um, the invitation. It's a great honor. I uh, truly love coming to Egypt, but this is not what I expected, sitting in my office and speaking to <laughs> you in Egypt and giving a lecture uh, without actually physically being present there. So. Um, I, it, it's, I, it's always a great honor for us to have you with us, Professor. Thank, thank you. you. I'd like to pass my regards to everyone who is watching and all my Egyptian colleagues, uh, many of whom are like uh, are like my brothers and sisters, and uh, we hope to keep the collaboration going in the future. Thank you, sir. Uh, would you like me to start the talk? Uh, yeah, yeah, you please, can start now. Please, you can go That's ahead. your presentation now. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So I was um, asked to speak on recalcitrant chronic sinusitis. And this is a topic that is uh, very near and dear to my heart because it really has become the one uh, part of, of at least my worry where I find that we are unable to find a, prob a, a solution to this problem. And so I want to discuss um, my thoughts on this. And then I would love to hear... Uh, your questions and maybe have some discussion on it. Um, because um, if somebody has an answer to this problem, I would love to hear it. Uh, I think it's a very multifaceted problem. And I don't think that one, uh, there is one answer to solving this group of um, issues that create recalcitrant chronic sinusitis in our patients uh, who just refuse to get better. So if you just go all the way down to chronic sinusitis, um, we know that most cases of chronic sinusitis are an evolution of unresolved acute sinusitis. So you've got your acute sinusitis that doesn't resolve over 12 weeks, and then you get your chronic sinusitis. And we know that when we get into that chronic sinusitis phase, these patients will, will essentially be very difficult to improve on medical management and a lot of these patients will end up getting um, surgical therapy. So the current guidelines um, support uh, maximal or adequate or optimal medical management, whatever you want to call it, prior to us taking these patients to surgery. And we all try very hard to get these patients better. We give them long-term macrolide antibiotics. We give them topical nasal steroids. We give them topical nasal steroid irrigations. We may even try oral uh, corticosteroids. And when these patients just do not improve or continue to get worse, in many cases having lower respiratory tract infections over time and eventually developing asthma, this ultimately leads us to surgical intervention. So when we operate on these patients, a lot of them get better. I would say about 85% of these patients um, heal, get beautifully improved and get discharged. And, and my feeling is that one of the things that we are fixing is the plumbing. We are plumbers of the sinuses. 
and we are fixing their plumbing. We're allowing the physiology to go back to normal because the sinuses can now get air in, can get the secretions out, and these patients improve, just like you would expect them to improve. But about 10 to 15% of these patients do not improve. They continue to have chronic inflammation and chronic symptoms. And when you break this group down, we find that about 8 to 10% of this group of patients are AFRS, or allergic fungal rhinosinusitis patients. And so they will not improve because they will continue to have some sort of an inflammatory response to fungal um, spores and, and fungal hyphae that they're breathing through, the, um, through their nose from the air uh, that creates an inflammatory reaction with eosinophils uh, and immunoglobulin E. And so we can actually control these patients quite nicely uh, with topical budesonide and watching them carefully. And, and my team and I have published uh, on this for the past 20 to 25 years. And it's shown that if you watch these patients carefully, most of these patients will lead a quite a normal life uh, as long as they agree to come and see you so you can keep an eye on their sinuses and they agree to continue to do their topical rinses with budesonide. And some of them will require stronger management strategies such as itraconazole. And more recently, uh, we've just published a paper on, um, on mipoluzumab on these patients. And some of them will require those advanced therapies. But by and large, a lot of the AFRS patients can be fairly well controlled. That leaves us with about 2 to 5% of patients who are not AFRS. They're recalcitrant chronic sinusitis patients. And it seems like no matter what we do, we can't get them better. So let's focus on those patients today. So the biggest question that I always have for these patients is where is the challenge here? So this is a very classic patient that will fill up my office. These are the patients who, who just line up outside um, because they don't know where to go. Uh, this is a 47-year-old female. She's got asthma, which you would expect. It's pretty well controlled. She's got a chronic history of postnasal post -nasal discharge, anterior nasal discharge. Uh, she feels stuffy in her nose. She has low-grade headaches. Uh, she has had a cough. And this is just going on for years since she was a teenager. She's had two previous surgeries. She's been on several courses of oral antibiotics. Um, the last surgery we did ourselves, so you can see this big entrostomy in the right maxillary sinus. Um, sinus. It's not um, a mega, mega entrostomy, but it's pretty large. It's quite open. Same thing on the other side, quite a nice big opening. We turn the scope, the 30 degree scope, to look upwards toward the frontal recess, and we see this thick mucopurulence just sitting up there in the frontal recess, completely stagnant, and it won't move. And when we look at the CT scan, it's quite good. All the sinuses are nicely open, the turbinates are preserved, uh, widely patent frontal recesses. Nothing is wrong with the surgical part of the sign of the disease. So when you start suctioning all this muck out of her sinuses, you see that it's very thick, it's um, gooey, it almost feels like uh, allergic mucin, but it isn't. And because she just doesn't fit the criteria for AFS, she doesn't have any of the signs of AFS, and she does not grow um, fungus on her cultures. But when we take this out, you can see there is this very thick biofilm. This is not mucin. This is biofilm, okay? And this is what's gonna, what we're going to focus on. So um, I'm going to ask you a question, and we can discuss this in our discussion. It didn't work. Your surgery, my friends, it didn't work. So what should we do? What are our options? So I talked to this about about uh, problems like this with my colleagues here in Canada, in the US, and many of them, and I'm sure you've heard them all, will say, make bigger holes, strip the mucous membrane, cut out those damn turbinates, they're the problem. I'm not sure that doing even more surgery in this patient is gonna make her better. 
she's got big holes. Everything is wide open. The secretions are not going anywhere. So should I do a medial maxillectomy? Should I do a mega entrostomy? Should I do a draft three? I don't know the answer, all right? I've done all of those things on previous patients like this, and it, I haven't been that impressed. And I feel that we don't know the problem. What is the problem? So the problem could be, in my mind, in two different places. Something could be wrong with the patient, right? Or something is significantly wrong with the bug, with the pathogen, with the bacteria or the fungus. So what can be wrong with the patient? The patient can have something wrong with the mucous membrane barrier. They can have a non-functional ciliary syndrome. We've seen those. They can have altered inflammatory pathways like AFRS. They can have immune deficiency syndromes. They can have GPA, lupus, all sorts of things. Or something is wrong with the pathogen. There's a biofilm. We can see it. Maybe it's very virulent. The microbiome may have changed, which we know is very important. Maybe the patient has had too much antibiotics in their lives and the microbiome has changed permanently. And we'll discuss all of these findings or all of these factors through the talk. There could be an interplay of one or more of the above factors. So recalcitrant sinusitis in a healthy person, right? Despite the best medical and surgical management can occur because of the altered microbiome, because of innate endotypes, something is wrong with the patient. We talked about the damaged epithelial barrier, the excessive inflammatory responses, and then we talked about the bad bugs, the virulent pathogens. So when you look at the interaction, the problem can be with the host immunity, with the pathogens, and with the impaired barrier function, okay? And this can interplay. So you can't, you don't necessarily have a problem just in one sector, you can have a problem in all three sectors. And this is very, very difficult to deal with. So let's deal with the microbiome, all right? The bugs in the sinus, something has changed because they have changed, all right? So what is the microbiome? Well, the microbiome, just the word the microbiome means the good guys, the good bugs. And that is divided into microbiota and microbiome. Microbiota is the community of microorganisms that lives in a specific ecological niche, okay? You have a community of microorganisms that live in the gums of your teeth, that live in your mouth, that live in your gut. That's the microbiota, okay? You want to have a healthy microbiota. The microbiome is the genome of the microbiota, okay? You're looking at the DNA of the microbiota. So when you have a microbiota, the bacteria, the good bacteria, and they get colonized by exogenous pathogens and pathobionts, which are pathogenic DNA, what happens is when you add an antibiotic to an environment, you kill the commensal microbiota and you allow the pathobionts to come in, break down the barrier, and then get into our bodies. The barrier is very important. And it's extremely important to keep that barrier healthy so that these pathobiomes don't get into our bodies, okay? So when you look at the microbiome, you have a healthy microbiota. You start the patients on antibiotics. You get a disturbance of this healthy microbiota. This creates a microbial dysbiosis which allows pathogens to come in and expand their presence. Inflammation will start, your body will react, kick the inflammatory pathogens out and you'll go back to recovery. So when you give somebody an antibiotic, you create this disturbance. And so this is a big problem, the antibiotics. Healthy microbiomes, essential for health. A dysbiotic microbiome, when you get an unhealthy microbiome where it changes, contributes to disease. And so you get a loss of balance between the healthy and the pathogenic bacteria. 
both of these, remember, both of these bacteria, the healthy and pathogenic bacteria live in that same environment in peace all the time. But when you disrupt them, then one takes over. And when the pathogenic bacteria take over, that's when you get into problems. So it's not just a bacterial attack. Don't think of it as a bacterial attack. Um, the diseased mucosa can attract unhealthy microbiomes by creating a new niche. Remember we talked about the niche? So if the mucosa gets diseased, you get a new environment that can change that balance. And then you can get systemic and local inflammation, loss of epithelial coverage, and then infection. So remember I talked about antibiotics. So um, I couldn't, on this graph, I couldn't find Egypt, but if you enlarge this graph, you can see Greece and Romania on the left using the highest number of bacteria, or sorry, antibiotics, Belgium, Italy. And then on the other end, you have Netherlands, Estonia, Sweden, and Canada is the red line right there. So in 2014, 23 million antimicrobial prescriptions were dispensed in Canada, right there, okay? The overall expenditure was almost a billion dollars and 87%, almost 90%, of these antibiotics were given by the family doctors or specialists in the community. Only 13% were given in hospitals. So the, the antibiotics are most often recommended for treating respiratory infections. 82% of acute sinusitis patients got antibiotics, 77% of bronchitis and 74% of pneumonia patients um, got antibiotics. So when you look at this, it's the upper um, the respiratory tract uh, that gets most of the antibiotics. In fact, if you just added um, chronic sinusitis and acute sinusitis um, with the bronchitis, that would make up most of the antibiotic prescriptions in Canada. And as you can see, as the patient gets from a, from a healthy control on the left to a diseased CRS patient on the right, you lose the gram positives and you gain the gram negatives, okay? So the gram negatives grow and the gram positives reduce. So we know that the gram negatives, they're present in the healthy state, but they get more in control as the patient gets sicker. It's a very important mindset to remember that these bugs exist in the healthy state. In our study, we showed that in chronic patients, 25% were anaerobes, 25% of patients grew anaerobes, about 40% of patients grew coag negative staph, the, about 11% grew staph aureus, and the rest of them grew pseudomonas and gram negative bacteria. So essentially it's anaerobes, pseudomonas, and staph that make up the problem in the sick patients. And it's not that they weren't there in the healthy patients, it's just that they've taken over the ecological niche in that environment. When you look at the Cochrane review, this is a review in 2012 done on um, acute sinusitis patients. And I just found some very interesting statements. It said that irrespective of whether antibiotics were given or placebo was given, 47% of patients were cured after one week and 71% after 14 days. It didn't matter whether they got antibiotics or placebo. 27% of participants who received antibiotics experienced adverse events as opposed to almost none in the placebo group. Another systemic, uh, systematic review in 2015 suggested that the usage of placebo has shown to be almost as efficacious as using antimicrobial therapy and much safer. So it seems to me that in most patients, in probably 80 to 90% of people who get antibiotics, get antibiotics that they don't need. And about 30% of those patients get side effects that they wouldn't have gotten if they didn't receive the antibiotics in the first place. So a very important message for us to remember and for us to give out there to the, to the GPs and the family doctors and the, and the pulmonologists. Antimicrobial resistance is a big deal, as you know. Um, inappropriate antimicrobial use is a, is a very big problem in the world and particularly antibiotics given to animals. So I remember when I was in Egypt, I, I, uh, one of the things that struck me was um, how much meat Egyptians love uh, because I'm a vegetarian and 
every dish was a meat dish and it was very hard to avoid meat. But if you look in the US, 80% of all antibiotics sold in the US are used in meat and poultry production. The vast majority is used on healthy animals to promote growth, prevent disease in crowded or unsanitary condition. That's something that we really need to sink in our heads. 80% of all antibiotics sold in the US was used in meat and poultry production. There is a direct connection between antibiotics used in animals and resistance of these drugs in humans. Direct connection, okay? So it seems to me that the meat industry is a big culprit in making humans sick. So let's talk about the microbiome in the sinuses. Let's focus just on the sinuses. This is a really nice pa paper in translational medicine, was published in 2012, and it showed some fantastic things and I have, a, I have sort of um, broken it down in a few slides. So compared to healthy individuals, so you're just comparing healthy individuals to chronic sinusitis patients. Um, CRS patients had a reduced bacterial richness, okay? So what that means is that the number of types of bacteria were reduced and it, uh, CRS patients had reduced bacterial evenness. So the distribution of bacterial types was reduced. So the number was reduced and the distribution was reduced. It wasn't as rich. Okay. Uh, for some reason, hang on. Oh, there we go. But what's most interesting was there was an equal number of pathogenic bacteria between the two groups. So healthy individuals and CRS patients had an equal number of known pathogenic bacteria. So if there were 20 pathogenic bacteria in CRS patients, those same 20 um, bacteria were present in healthy individuals as well. Very important to remember that. So now look at, let's look at the particular bacteria in there. The CRS patients had a significant reduction in lactobacillus saccae and a significant increase in carinobacterium, okay? So just for fun, both these bacteria were present in both groups, but one had increased lactobacillus uh, in the healthy group and in the sick group, that group that in a bacteria reduced and the opposite with carinobacterium. And when you check the SNOT scores on these patients, it correlated. The high, high SNOT scores were patients with C with the carinobacterium. So ultimately, there was a depletion of microbial diversity that was induced with antibiotics. Uh, the carinobacterium when instilled into the sinuses exhibited goblet cell hyperplasia, which resulted in more mucus production, more congestion. And if you added lactobacillus saccae, then the counts of the carinobacterium reduced and there was no significant increase in goblet cell hyperplasia. So where do you find lactobacillus saccae, right? Because it's a protector of the sinus epithelium. It's a gram-positive anaerobe. It's found in kimchi and it's used in meat fermentation. And I don't know if you guys have um, eaten kimchi. It's a very smelly uh, food uh, from uh, South Korea or in Korea where they put uh, cabbage underground and let it pretty much rot for up to four to six months. They dig it out of the ground and then they eat it. And it smells horrible, but it has very healthy bacteria that is very protective for the sinuses. So um, when you look at this um, systematic reviews of the sinonasal microbiome, you've, there's one very important thing that you find. You find that there is no common phyla that's present in both the CRS and healthy controls. There is no consistent enrichment of any particular species, and there's no clear organism that causes CRS. So, in, you know, in GI um, ulcers, uh, we know that um, H. pylori is the responsible bacteria, and if you treat that, the ulcers go away. Well, we don't have one responsible bacteria or taxon or species that causes CRS, and that's the problem. There's nothing that we can 
take out of the mix that'll make patients better. Everything that's happening is because it's because of a microbial dysbiosis. And so this is called an imbalance of the species uh, that comprises the microbiome. And this is seen in other parts of the body, like the gut microbiome after antibiotic therapy. And when patients get C. diff, it's seen in obesity, it's seen in Crohn's disease, it's seen in dental disease, it's seen in bacterial vaginosis. An imbalance of the species is what's going on in our sinuses. So recalcitrant chronic sinusitis can, in part, potentially, be attributed to drug-resistant bacteria formation of biofilms within the sinus cavities, okay? So when you change that balance, you can start forming biofilms. So when that happens, you must think of other possible diagnoses. Is something wrong with the patient? Remember we said things can happen in concert. One thing doesn't happen to doesn't need to happen on its own. Always, when you're dealing with patients with recalcitrant sinusitis, always check for immunodeficiency. All my patients get an IgG with subclasses, and I'm surprised that quite often to find that up to 50% of these patients have some sort of an immunodeficiency. So look for that. A lot of them can have systematic or systemic diseases, um, such as sarcoidosis, GPA, lupus, um, even rheumatoid arthritis can cause uh, CRS, uh, even Crohn's disease. So make sure you ask about things like that and, and investigate it further. Just don't think about CRS in isolation. So let's talk about biofilms. I mentioned the word biofilm. What is a biofilm? So remember we talked about the microbiome and I said those were the good guys or the good bugs. Biofilms are formed by the bad bugs, okay? So you've got the good bugs and the bad bugs. And the biofilms are communities of microorganisms that are, that are encased in a protective extracellular matrix that resides in tissue surfaces. You see biofilms everywhere, and we'll talk about this. But biofilms allow for evasion of host defenses. That means none of your uh, defense mechanisms, uh, your, your, um, your uh, inflammatory cytokines, your inflammatory uh, pathways will be able to get through a biofilm. They have decreased susceptibility to antibiotics. Antibiotics will just bounce off them. Uh, and what they do is they create uh, planktonic bacteria, which then floats across to the next site and creates a biofilm at the next site. So bacteria can result, can, can um, live in a biofilm state or they can break off a biofilm in a planktonic form, go downstream and create another biofilm downstream. Okay, so this is a big deal. Biofilms have been discovered um, years and years ago. Um, they've been present in fossil records. Uh, they were first discovered to be a cause of CRS only in 2004. That's the first time that we thought of biofilms in sinus disease, and that's you know not even 20 years ago. Um, we know that it has a role in the persistence of recalcitrant chronic infections. Uh, uh, MSSA, MRSA, uh, Pseudomonas are all known to form biofilms within the sinuses. We know that they are we have very poor response to uh, topical uh, and typical treatments uh, for biofilms, and they're very very difficult to eradicate completely. It's almost like we have nothing uh, in our armamentarium that can, get, that can get rid of biofilms. So what are our management options for biofilms? And a few of the things I'm gonna talk about is very novel therapy that we are researching. There's some stuff that I've left out from the talk only because of time. And we can discuss that further um, if we get time in our discussion section. But here you see a patient that has head surgery, um, beautiful middle meters, and you see a thick biofilm sitting in the ethmoid cavities that's just driving her crazy. So what have we tried for these patients? We've tried topical antibiotics uh, because we are trying, remember we are trying to avoid oral antibiotics because they don't really touch uh, biofilms. So topical antibiotics can provide um, high levels of localized concentration of drugs. I will use things like uh, tobramycin, gentamicin, um, ceftazidim, ceftriaxone, all in a topical format, okay? So I'll culture the biofilm, try and figure out what the culture shows, although we know that cultures are not great 
in figuring out what uh, biofilm has. Ideally, you should do PCR analysis on these patients to figure out what bad bugs have created the biofilm. Hard to do in a regular practice. Uh, topical antibiotics are safe. They have minimal system, systemic absorption. They're actually quite cheap and they decreased and have significantly decreased morbidity because the antibiotic doesn't have to go through the patient's system uh, to create an effect. Irrigations, I really um, believe in topical irrigations. Uh, and this has become a real problem in the world of COVID because it can be an uh, AGMP uh, procedure. So we have actually stopped irrigating our patients currently. But an irrigation attempts to mechanically debride mucus and infectious debris. It disrupts the biofilm structure and you actually deliver the biofilm out of the patient like I showed you in the very first video. And then you can deliver medications directly uh, to the diseased um, site. And we've published on this uh, and you're welcome to look up the publications. Uh, Mupyrosin became quite famous uh, because it's a pseudomonic acid uh, anti uh, antimicrobial. So um, mupyrosin, which in North America is called bacitracin, is a top, uh, can be used as a topical antibiotic irrigation. I will use a 15 gram tube, put it in uh, 500 ml of um, saline, mix it up really well, and then the patients will use that to irrigate their sinuses twice a day. It actually works quite well in Staph aureus biofilm. I use it cautiously and I'll tell you why in a bit. Um, it's a great alternative to intravenous antibiotics, but remember that it also is an antibiotic. Um, it, in studies um, that I've listed on the slide here, it improved symptoms, reduced MRSA loads on subsequent cultures, but unfortunately, um, when you stop the mepirosin irrigations, the MRSA tended to return. Um, concerns, uh, changes in microbial, uh, uh, microbiologic cultures, results before and after the therapy, um, and you get an abrogation of the culturable sinus bacteria after mepirosin rinses, okay? Uh, and topical antibiotic therapy may have a role in replacing oral or IV treatments um, but can have an adverse impact on the microbiota of the sinuses. So just remember when these patients stop using the mupyrosin, you'll have a completely new microbiome in the sinuses because it is um, an antibiotic uh, and it works topically. But when, when things um, are failing, it may be an, something in your armamentarium that you can try. Surfactants, um, we have all heard of Johnson & Johnson baby shampoo. Trials uh, became quite famous uh, around 2010. Um, was generally well tolerated, very inexpensive. Uh, and then they found that uh, it causes hyposmia and anosmia at higher concentrations. I still will sometimes use this, but in very small concentrations. Uh, I tell patients to use only two drops in 250 mils of saline and rinse their nose out. I'll do olfactory function tests before and after. And at that concentration, I haven't found it to be a problem. So I think it's something to keep in the back of your mind for this very difficult to treat patients. Manuka honey, uh, as most of you know, uh, we were the first people to trial this in vitro and in vivo. Um, and it works on a selected group of patients and we have published on this. There's a group of patients that have a particular cytokine profile um, that um, respond to Manuka honey. And I won't go into those studies because that will take forever. Uh, but it does have a very uh, precise antimicrobial action. Uh, it does have several components within it which make it effective. It has a very high sugar content, uh, has a very low water activity, has a very low pH, and it forms hydrogen peroxide upon dilution. And hydrogen peroxide is something that we're actually studying at present as a potential treatment for this group of patients. And maybe that's why Manuka honey works so well. Uh, methylglyoxal or MGO has been identified as the dominant antimicrobial component of Manuka honey. It's present in all honeys, but in Manuka honey, it's present in a very high concentration. We see incredible responders to Manuka honey. These are two of my patients that had failed pretty much every treatment you can see uh, on the slides on the left that they have um, this biofilm 
uh, staph uh, infection and um, it's cleared up quite nicely with 12 weeks of Manuka honey. This only happens in about 40% of patients. And like I told you earlier, there's a particular cytokine profile in these patients uh, that will respond to this uh, group, to this uh, medication. So it's a very promising alternative for topical use. It's not an antibiotic, uh, but we know that when we combine it with other antibiotics, uh, it, the effectiveness gets stronger, especially in vitro. This has not been studied as well in vivo, but when it was combined with things like tetracycline or oxacillin uh, and even mupiracin, uh, the, the effect of, of, the, of the interaction between the two uh, got much better. So it is a synergistic activity uh, against MRSA. Uh, it's also very good as an antifungal. I use it a lot in my AFRS patients, uh, and we have published on that as well. Uh, but there is no clinical studies for use in routine CRS. Again, keep it in your back of your minds. And there's a group of patients uh, that this will really work on and will surprise you. The thing to remember is that Manuka honey in high quality is very expensive. Um, we call it um, yellow gold. It's actually more expensive than gold, so it's extremely expensive. I'm gonna throw in a couple of other things. Uh, colloidal silver is a homeopathic medicine that I think deserves mention, um, but um, it also needs further investigation. I've had some patients where I've had success with colloidal silver irrigations, but I have to say it hasn't been, um, it doesn't hit the ball out of the park. It hasn't been amazing. Systematic, systemic treatment. So um, there are many systemic treatments that we can try, but the antimicrobials um, really are my last resort in treating these patients. When nothing else works, that's when I'll try um, antibiotics. And I do um, use long-term low-dose macrolides when everything has failed. Um, and I've had, I have to say, a small group of patients that are still on this and are still under good control. I would say out of thousands of patients, maybe one or 2% of my patients will use this. Um, macrolides in long-term low-dose concentrations inhibit neutrophilic migration, uh, reduce oxidative bursts, increase apoptosis uh, in inflammatory cells, um, can decrease the amount of mucus in the diseased airways, uh, can have a reparative effect on the airway mucosa uh, and it inhibits pseudomonal biofilm formation. So yes, I will use this um, after everything else has failed. And we can discuss that further. Um, systemic antimicrobial treatments for MRSA. Uh, we've used clindamycin, tetracycline, including doxycycline, uh, septra, uh, sulfa medications, vancomycin, um, all have been found to be useful. Uh, linezolide is a controlled drug in Canada. It's very expensive and it's fantastic for um, staph infection or MRSA in the sinuses. And we, we control it only for CF patients. And I, I, have, um, I have to say that it's a very effective um, antimicrobial. And I think the reason is, is because it's very protected. We can't prescribe it. It has to be prescribed by ID doctors. Um, and, and so it's, it's not being uh, abused at all in the, in the community. And it's very expensive. So let's talk about future directions. We have a few minutes to talk about future directions. Um, I'm gonna talk about some of the things on the screen uh, and then there's others um, as well. But these are the things that we are um, really uh, investigating at present. So Poloxamer 407 gels. So um, you can see on the screen I'm putting uh, something that looks very liquidy, but as soon as it touches the mucous membrane of the sinus, you can see it turns into a gel, okay? That is Poloxamer 407 gel. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it. It's a thermoreversible gel, which means that it's liquid in cold environments and it gels up in warm environments. So we keep it in the fridge, patient comes in, and then we use it. The reason why it is such an interesting gel is because by itself, it has antimicrobial properties, but the way, it, um, the way its chemical structure is organized is that it, it has a hydrophobic chain on the inside and two hydrophilic chains on the outside. 
and you can then attach any kind of antibiotic or antifungal or medication to these hydrophilic chains. Um, and so you can put anything in it. You can make a poloxomer gel with gentamicin, with um, itraconazole, with uh, gentamicin, with tobramycin, with anything you want. And um, our pharmacists are trained to do that. And so we'll culture the patients, uh, we'll figure out what the uh, microbiome uh, or biofilm is made of, and then we'll make a, a gel particular for that particular uh, biofilm. And then we'll use it on these patients. And we've had some great success with this. Um, it's, it was originally thought to be an inert molecule, but now we know that it, it independently reduces inflammation and it can carry two or more medications at the same time. And the key about this gel is it'll stain the sinuses for up to two to five days, as opposed to a, a liquid antibiotic that we put in there that'll disappear within 30 seconds. So that in itself, I think is a big deal. Here's a patient um, with a fungal biofilm in her sinuses. And here we're filling it up with a, a gel that has, um, that has um, sporanox or itraconazole in it. Um, recent trials at our center with mupiracin and doxycycline in the poloxomer uh, 407 gels um, have shown some very promising outcomes. Here is a, a patient uh, on the trial. Uh, this patient, um, as you can see, has um, not had surgery, has uh, bacteria uh, in all her sinuses. We did the surgery, continue to have bacteria in her sinuses. And on the left, you can see the biofilm. And on the right, you can see how it's healed up uh, with the gel treatment. So very, very effective. She came in uh, every week uh, for treatment for four weeks and completely cleared up uh, of all this chronic biofilm. She never took an oral antibiotic and didn't do any rinsing at home at all. I'm gonna change gears and talk about another thing that we are studying and that's been actually published, was published last year in the European Journal. Uh, and you can look at the publication, but betadine is uh, povidone iodine. It's diluted iodine um, saline which the patient rinses, um, we put two mils of 10% povidone in 250 mils of saline rinse. So it's a 0.08% solution. And we found that it was fantastic for eradicating chronic and stubborn biofilm uh, and helping these patients with recalcitrant infections. I'll show you some of our results. Um, it was very useful in the elderly population, in the CF population and patients with systemic diseases. Uh, you can't combine this with a soap because it'll make the iodine ineffective. Um, some patients require a diluted strength because they have some stinging sensation. Nobody, no humans have, uh, have an allergy to iodine. So the, the only thing that they, they report sometimes is that it stings and then you just dilute it some more. And so here is a patient um, that you can see has chronic inflammation has uh, there's obvious microbial dysbiosis, there's bacteria laying on the floor of the sinus, and then this is the same patient after um, betadine irrigations. Here's another patient, this is a uh, fungal patient that completely cleared up with um, betadine irrigations. So what did we find in this, pa what did we find in this patient? So we found that the MLK discharge um, score improved by more than one point in 64%. Um, and the total MLK score improved by 74, improved by one point in 75%. Uh, so a very good response to betadine. Uh, when, and then we noticed that when the discharge improved on these patients, their um, edema and polyposis improved by 71%. Uh, when the discharge remained unchanged, their edema and polyposis didn't improve as much, improved only by 42%. So there was a very good effect um, on these patients uh, with betadine irrigations. And it remained, what we're showing here is that it remains prolonged over a period of time. So in summary, uh, iodine rinses are, first of all, they're very cheap. Um, they reduce endoscopic signs of infection in this group of patients. It's not limited by gender. Uh, it's effective with or without concurrent antibiotics or antifungals. And the long-term benefit is sustained over time and further research is, re is required. And so we are currently doing a prospective study that is double-blinded, placebo-controlled, uh, that should be published uh, hopefully in the next year or two. 
The last thing I want to talk about is antimicrobial photodynamic therapy. Um, with COVID, you may have heard of photodynamic therapy because um, it does kill uh, not only bacteria, but it'll kill viruses and fungi. Here's a patient on the left side getting treatment. It's basically a photo disinfection system uh, that de delivers photodynamic therapy uh, to the sinonasal cavity without being um, a liquid or an antibiotic uh, pill. It's pre pretty much just light. And it works on biofilms, uh, works on gram-negative bacteria, and works on antimicrobial resistant organisms. It disrupts bacterial cell walls with uh, oxygen-free radicals. Uh, it's generated from a certain wavelength of laser light. Uh, and, it's, uh, and we use methylene blue dye as a photoactive interaction. So basically you'll get the uh, methylene blue that'll get absorbed in the cell walls of the bacteria or the viruses. And then the light will cause um, a reaction that will uh, burst the bacteria or the or kill the viruses. So here you can see the methylene blue going into the infected sinus cavity. And this patient was not responding to anything and continued to have uh, recurrent infections and recurrent um, biofilm formation that we just could not get rid of. So we've put some um, methylene blue in there. Then we put a balloon in and within the balloon, right in the center of that catheter is a filament that will carry the 670 nanometer uh, light source. So we enlarge the balloon and when we enlarge the balloon, you'll see this thick biofilm ooze out of the sinuses right there, okay? So that is the thing that we cannot deal with uh, with any sort of antibiotics or topical treatment. So this balloon now turns into a light bulb inside the sinus, and then we turn it on and we leave it on for up to eight minutes. And more recently, we've realized that four minutes is plenty. So um, we're, doing it for, we're now doing it for four minutes and um, we have a study undergoing uh, on this treatment right now. So I want to talk about um, this gentleman. He's a 66 year old Hong Kong businessman who had surgery done elsewhere. Um, he came in with colored, smelly discharge from the left nostril. He was a you know, very wealthy uh, businessman with many factories and offices all over the world. And he said, you know, this is very socially embarrassing. When I'm in a boardroom, I can tell that people can smell um, the horrible smell from my nose. It was affecting his personal life, his business life. His wife didn't want to come near him because he smelled. I saw him for the first time in March of 2017. Um, on his history, um, he had, had a previous surgery in 2012, a complete left image-guided surgery, um, and had ongoing issues with the left maxillary sinus despite maximal medical therapy. The maxillary sinus had been opened, but had been non-responsive to all oral and topical medications. And when I look, you, when you look at the um, when you look at the referral letter from the referring physician, it says the patient has been using uh, clarithromycin BID for two months and is still experiencing yellow discharge on the left hand side every day. The patient also uses palmicord impregnated sinus rinses. Uh, he did not have any symptoms of nasal obstruction, uh, and he also has a significant amount of post nasal drainage. Okay. So when you look at his um, pre-op CT scan, you can see that the left maxillary sinus and the ethmoid sinus are very badly infected. And my suspicion is that this uh, was uh, plugged up because of a, an anatomical obstruction that then resulted in the um, microbiome changing, a microbial dysbiosis occurring, and the bad pathogenic bacteria taking over. So this is his um, sinus cavity when he um, came to me, you can see the frontal sinus, the ethmoid sinus, beautiful. And then you turn the scope uh, and you look in the maxillary sinus and it's got stagnant secretions, um, looks very much like staph infection. Uh, the cilia seem to be uh, very, I would say exhausted and non-functional and the um, bugs are just sitting there completely stagnant. So we cultured it and on the cultures, 
uh, you can see that he has uh, four plus gram negative bacilli, uh, three plus gram positive cocci, uh, and on the cultures, he grows uh, staph aureus um, and strep constellatus, okay, on his repeated cultures. And it's sensitive to penicillin and vancomycin, but none of that in terms of oral antibiotics is working. And none of that is working as a topical antibiotic as well. So this is the classic patient where you need to resort to uh, research methods of, of treating them because he has microbial dysbiosis that is unresponsive to everything. So the question is, can we reset his microbiome? So he underwent two treatments of APDT on April 18th and May 25th. Um, so after the first treatment, he had improvement for a few days and then he came back with um, return of the cacosmia and uh, pus on exam. And so we repeated the treatment in May of 2017 uh, and he came back in June with no further cacosmia, no discharge or symptoms and completely clear sinuses. And this is his treatment taking place and this is him now, completely um, cleared. He is one of the happiest patients that I have. He um, sends me patients from all over the world, his friends uh, in Hong Kong, um, all of his family members, anybody with sinusitis shows up here um, because they just are so impressed with this treatment. So we essentially reset the microbiome and got rid of the microbial dysbiosis. So the message here is that it is possible to reset the microbiome. Okay, it's a feasible alternative. Uh, I know that it's research treatment right now. Most people don't have access to this, but the uh, results are very promising. And hopefully this is a kind of treatment that will spread around the world and everybody will be able to do it. The problem that I see with, um, with APDT is that it leaves us with a sterile sinus. And in some of my patients, when we've done this, we've realized that you end up with a sterile sinus and then an even more stronger pathogen can find its way in there and the patients can get actually can get worse. So we had about five to 10% of our patients who actually got a stronger uh, bacteria that went in there and make them worse. So the question is, how can we fix that? Can we give them something after the treatment so that they can um, have a normal microbiome? And so we thought about a snot transplant from studies that have happened in C. difficile where they have uh, transplanted poop, right? So why can't we translate, uh, trans, um, transplant snot? So this is a study that has been approved by Health Canada, has been approved by our ethics division, and um, the study has actually already started um, and results are pending and will be coming shortly. There are three arms to the study. One is APDT by itself, which will sterilize the sinus, and that's all the patient will get and the new microbiome will reestablish itself from the surrounding sinuses. Um, then we have a second group where we'll do APDT uh, followed by a snot transplant. So we'll do the treatment and then we'll take um, healthy microbiome from a donor. And that's usually a son or a daughter of the patient uh, who has never had sinus disease where we take um, some mucus from their sinuses, uh, mix it with saline, and put it in the patient's um, sinuses. So if you're doing a snot transplant, and then there's a third group of patients we're doing a snot transplant by itself without doing APDT. So a very interesting study. There's um, 30 patients in each arm, and um, hopefully we'll get through this study in the next couple of years and have it published soon. So stay tuned. So very promising uh, way of treating uh, uh, resistant bacteria uh, because it's got a very strong and effective kill rate. So implications of microbiome, restoring a normal uh, equilibrium is very important. Um, you want to destroy the pathogenic bacteria, improve mucosal conditions, improve mucosal regeneration, and introduce healthy bacteria or probiotics. So I'm gonna end by talking about probiotics because a very good friend of mine who I think you all know, Martin Desrosier, who lives in Montreal, has been studying probiotics and actually has started a company where he's selling probiotics. And um, what are probiotics? Well, probiotics are live bacteria or microbes um, that you give to the patient and it restores the health 
by over uh, flooding the area of the disease and getting rid of the pathogenic bacteria. And it's been proven to be very useful in the GI tract, um, has not been uh, proven to be very useful in the sinuses so far. But it would hopefully uh, be able to do this, but there's no data in the nose and sinuses. So Lactococcus lactis um, is a, remember I talked about a lactobacilli. This is another lactobacilli that he's um, studying. Um, it induces IL-10 secretion, reduces CD8 activity, um, has antimicrobial and antifungal properties. Uh, intranasal administration was safe in mice. Um, and um, a 14 day irrigation of these patients with this was well tolerated. Um, it remains present uh, after treatment in the sinus cavities. It improved sinus symptoms, not 22s and mucosal grading scores. Um, it, has just, um, it has just been introduced uh, as a treatment. I am not sure how effective it will be. Um, this is just one study that was done by them. Uh, so there was a bit of a bias, uh, but the rest of the world, all of us, uh, will be the ones who will be uh, making judgment on this as, as time proceeds. But um, I have my thoughts about it, uh, which I will leave for questions in the future. Um, like I said earlier, there is no one bacteria that's implicated in sinusitis, and they are treating, trying to treat this with one bacteria. So you have to uh, question that a little bit, but uh, let's see how it goes. So uh, I'm going to end. Uh, by saying that recalcitrant sinusitis affects about 10 to 15 percent of patients despite optimal medical management. Um, there have been significant advances in topical therapies, particularly uh, budesonide has really helped our patients with AFS. Um, I've talked about some of the other therapies. I think the next therapy that's going to be very, very big is uh, betadine and uh, potentially uh, peroxide. And there's something else that we're studying. It's nitric oxide. So those are all research therapies which will hopefully make it big. I think betadine is something that's available worldwide. It's very cheap and anybody can use it. So please feel free to try it. And then of course, I didn't spend too much time talking about cytokines, but uh, personalized medicine is a big thing and upcoming in the future. I'm gonna end there. I'm not sure um, that IFOS will happen next year um, because of COVID, but um, the date is still there, June 19th to 23rd, 2021. And hopefully um, uh, you will come uh, uh, or will have the guts to come, but you're all invited. Uh, this is uh, Vancouver uh, viewed outside my office with the mountains in the background. It's a beautiful city and uh, you're all welcome um, to come and visit uh, and join us uh, at the St. Paul Sinus Center at any time. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to end there and take questions. Uh, I'll let Muhammad uh, and uh, Mustafa take over. Hello, Prof. Amin. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks for your nice lecture. So now we will start with the questions now. Sure. Okay. Okay, so... Um, the question is, can you agree that prebiotics and probiotics have a useful role in immune system improvement in chronic infection in ENT like sauerkraut of Germany? Uh, it is delicious, tastes like a salted pickle and Yakult made in Japan is sold in Indian supermarkets. Um, you know, I think that anything that improves the richness uh, of the bacteria in your sinuses uh, is very useful and very helpful. And what you're mentioning is essentially a very healthy diet. And we know that diet is everything. Um, we know that, for instance, uh, what is added to meat really makes uh, it a worrisome diet. What you're talking about is a very plant-based diet, and we know that plant-based diets are very healthy. I'm not sure that sauerkraut or Yakult or um, kimchi um, in one or the other is better than the other, uh, but I do know that all of those contain a very wide variety of 
different uh, bacteria that are very healthy and uh, protective for the sinuses. And in kimchi, the studies have shown uh, a very high concentration of lactobacillus. Uh, and similar studies have been done and showed that to be present in sauerkraut, which is actually not that much different. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what Yakult is, but it's probably very similar to that. So I am I'm very much in favor of that of that kind of a diet. Yes. Uh, I like this question. It says meat is an important source of protein. Uh, I am not I am not trashing meat at all. Um, I um, can tell you that there are many 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 uh, protein alternatives in the plant based world um, that we can talk about if you want. Um, but uh, you don't actually have to eat meat to get uh, your daily protein. Um, I haven't eaten meat for the last five years and I don't miss it. Um, and I was a big meat eater and a big meat lover. Uh, but the reason I stopped was not because of the fact that it's meat, uh, but because of the fact that it's almost impossible to get organic meat. And, uh, you know, when I grew up in, I grew up in Africa, I grew up in Kenya, um, where we had very organic meat. And if you eat meat in Africa, it's very different than the meat that you taste uh, in Canada and in the US. Um, it's um, when you eat a Big Mac in Canada or the US, it tastes um, very different than the meat that I think you eat in Cairo or in Africa. But yes, it is an important source of protein, not the only source of protein though. So a uh, good question. Uh, how do you deal with patients who come to you with recurrent sinusitis after a perfect FES? So um, this is a good question. And I, I would ask you a question with this question. Um, first of all, um, the, if you have dealt with the problem of plumbing, if you have fixed the plumbing, uh, then the physiology of the patient should take over and the patient should be clear. Now, I noticed you mentioned recurrent sinusitis and not chronic recalcitrant sinusitis, which are two different things. So if a patient has recurrent sinus infections, which by definition is four more infections per year uh, that are, that are um, identified, cultured, um, and, and documented, um, there could be several reasons for that. So, uh, you know, if they've young children at home, um, they may be getting uh, recurrent viral sinusitis, which doesn't bother me. I would just deal with that with topical um, therapies, topical rinses. Um, I, I have a patient exactly like this who I tell to use um, betadine irrigation. So I say, anytime you get a recurrent infection, uh, and as soon as you notice that it starts, start using your betadine irrigations and it works great. The patients just love it. It's very cheap, it's very effective, it doesn't spoil. Uh, they're not harming themselves in any way. So that's a really nice trick to learn is to have them get a bottle of 10% betadine, keep it at home, put a teaspoon of betadine in a, in a sinus rinse bottle and rinse their nose out uh, with 250 mils of saline. Works great. So that's how I deal with these patients. Do you inform your patients before FES? Uh, next question. Do you inform your patients before FES uh, that uh, sinusitis and allergic rhinitis always recurs? Okay, so I'm, I'm thinking you're talking about allergies. Um, so I tell my patients that allergic rhinitis, um, surgery is not the treatment for allergic rhinitis. I tell them that their allergic rhinitis may um, feel a lot better. Uh, but it hasn't been cured because you can't cure allergies with surgery. But what you do, what you do, do is you create more space in their nose, uh, more space in their sinuses, and that allows more air to go through. So even when they have an allergic reaction, like right now in Canada, it's spring, a lot of allergens in the air. A lot of my post-surgical patients will say, "Oh, you cured my allergies," and I'll say, "No, I didn't cure your allergies. It's just, it's just that your symptoms." Uh, are not as severe because even the swelling of the allergy doesn't obstruct you. So allergic rhinitis, I mean, there are some um, surgical methods that you can use for allergic rhinitis. I'm just writing a chapter on allergic rhinitis for the Oxford textbook that, um, that I can send you if you're interested, um, which goes into detail for treatment. But um, 
posterior nasal nerve cryoablation uh, is a treatment that um, has been researched and shown to work really well in uh, patients with allergic rhinitis. So in general, I tell them that you might feel better, but FES is not a treatment for allergic rhinitis. Next question. Is there a role for clarithromycin for mucoregulation in such cases? Uh, yes, I think there is definitely a role for clarithromycin uh, for uh, mucoregulation. I think um, it is definitely worth thinking about this in the back of your minds and keeping it there for times when you need it. I am not a fan of using antibiotics long-term, but um, before I use something like PDT, um, because it's so expensive in a research uh, treatment, I will try out clarithromycin long-term to see if they'll get better. And I've had some very pleasant uh, responses for sure. All right, I was wondering when we would get to COVID-19. So here's our first epidemic question. Um, during this epidemic situation, do you recommend for saline, saline irrigations to be continued or can it be a source of spreading the virus to the respiratory tract? What do you recommend for the patient? Okay, great question. So um, I will tell you that we are um, doing a study right now on, um, mu uh, on uh, um, betadine, povidone iodine, rinses in COVID patients because um, the research has shown, and we're, we're actually just publishing a paper this week uh, that showed that uh, betadine will kill um, COVID-19 within 15 seconds of contact. So uh, we're taking 30 patients um, and starting them on, on betadine rinses, all COVID positive, all at home. We're taking 30 patients who are going to do saline rinses. These are homebound COVID positive patients. And um, we're taking 30 patients and using a, a novel betadine gel that they can uh, spray in their nose to avoid the rinse issue that you just mentioned. And um, hopefully, it's a 14-day study, so hopefully we'll have the results very quickly and have this published. I am uh, telling patients um, uh, in the COVID situation, first of all, we have very little COVID in Vancouver, but I am telling patients to use betadine in their rinses if they have any sort of COVID symptom. Okay, so if they have a runny nose, fever, cough, uh, upper respiratory tract symptoms, um, any viral symptoms, that they should put betadine in their rinses. And I've had two COVID patients who have completely cleared up with betadine rinses. Um, and I had two patients who were exposed to patients, exposed to COVID patients who used betadine and never developed any symptoms. That's not a study. Uh, a study is underway, and hopefully we can give you some proper scientific results shortly. I am not. I, I am not actively telling them to stop saline irrigations, uh, but I am telling them to put betadine in their saline if they want to keep irrigating. A lot of them have stopped irrigating on their own uh, because they are worried that the virus can track its way into the lower uh, respiratory tract. Good question, though. All right, so uh, what is your current, what is your cutoff point between medical and surgical management of CRS? So I think, you know, it's a great question, um, Mustafa. I think for me, uh, being um, in a very tertiary center, I hardly ever get primary patients. Uh, and, I, and when I get the primary patient with CRS, a lot of them have had long treatments with medications. Uh, they have seen several ENTs before me. They have seen um, ID doctors. They have seen respirologists. So a lot of them have, have exhausted their medical treatments. And they'll come to me and say, uh, we know that you do great surgery. Can you do surgery on me? And I'll say, hang on a second. Let's try one more treatment of medication. You know, let's, let me try with my beta in rinses. Let's try pulmicot rinses. Let's try... Uh, culture-directed antibiotics if they've never been tried. And, and I'll do that for six to 12 weeks um, and see how they do. And if they fail that, then I'll say, fine, I'll proceed with surgery. Uh, having said that, the truth is that a lot of these patients will show up and they will not even listen to me. They'll say, I'm done. I've had too many antibiotics. Uh, I've had too much medical management. I, I'm sick of this disease and I want to go into surgery. 
and try and clear it surgically. And then we sit down and have a very, very detailed discussion about surgery, about the failure rates, about the recalcitrant CRS. We talk about the diagnosis, whether it's AFRS or not AFRS. We talk about the diagnosis, whether it's polyposis or not. Um, there's one statement that I tell them that I think you should tell all your patients is that surgery requires very good follow-up and they just can't do surgery and disappear. So I tell them that when I operate on your sinuses, technically your sinuses become my sinuses and I own your sinuses and you have to bring them back for servicing just like you would bring a car back for servicing. And, and that's really important. I, I watch them very carefully for the first six months before I, I sort of let them go for a year. Uh, most of them will, will be followed at six days, six weeks, 12 weeks, and 24 weeks. And if by 24 weeks they're perfect, then I'll see them back in a year. But if they're not perfect, then I'll keep watching them carefully. Good question. Is there any surgical clinical tips uh, that have to be followed during the primary surgical intervention in order to avoid such post-op operative scenarios during CRS? You know, that's a really good question. Um, so uh, I have my opinions. Um, I feel, I feel um, that your surgery has to be uh, very well done. Uh, meticulous handling of the tissues. Um, I don't like being aggressive. I don't like to cut off the turbinates. I don't like to strip off the mucous membrane. I don't like making huge entrostomies in patients who are not uh, polypoid patients or AFRS patients or tumor patients. Uh, I will not do mega entrostomies like a lot of people will do at the drop of a hat. I have colleagues who will do draft threes on primary patients. I, I, I don't believe in that. I can show you many, many patients who um, had a score of 24 out of 24 on their C CT score, uh, very diseased, very sick, and now look phenomenal after a very good fest with excellent opening of all their cavities, removing all the cells, doing wide open surgery without being aggressive. Um, I don't take out the superior turbinate in every case. I have colleagues in this city who will cut out the superior turbinate in every single case. I don't think that's necessary. I don't cut out the middle turbinate in, in every case. I have colleagues in this city who cut out the middle and inferior turbinate on every case. And I'm sure you have colleagues exactly like that. So a lot of these patients will end up in my practice as recalcitrant patients. So all those recalcitrant uh, patients that I showed you, I would say very, very few are mine. Most of them are patients that I've inherited because the other surgeons have done this to them and then told them that there's nothing else to do uh, and to disappear. And so they disappear into my, into my clinics and, and I really look after them and try and get them better. But that's my, my um, biggest advice to you is be very meticulous with your operation and very gentle with your hands. Um, should we avoid revision fest in such cases if we are sure of the perfection of the primary surgery? You know, if I do a primary operation uh, and I feel that it's really well done, and the patient continues to have, let's say, I had a patient this morning uh, that I saw on telehealth, um, had chronic inflammation in the left frontal sinus, okay? He was very diseased when I saw him. Uh, we did a revision surgery. He had primary surgery done elsewhere. So we did revision surgery, which we did extremely well. We were um, very happy with everything. All the sinuses healed up perfectly. He's a captain on one of the, one of the ships here. Um, and now he has a little bit of inflammation and little, uh, tiny symptoms in his left frontal sinus. It's quite minimal. And he says, oh, I can live with this. And when we scope him, he's got a tiny bit of inflammation in the left frontal sinus. So what do you do with this patient? So anytime I have a patient that's failing, and that's what I call a failure, I'll do a CT scan. And on the CT scan, if I find a reason for the failure, let's say I forgot a cell. Let's say there was a uh, a cap of an agar that, that my fellow missed or I missed and it's causing this inflammation. Then I'll, tell, I'll sit down with the patient. I'll show them the CT scan. I say, here's the problem. Here's where I think the problem is. And I go back and fix that one problem. Okay, very quick, very short. Um, and that's what I call a proper revision. To go back on that patient and start doing a drill out 
or start doing a, a, a draft three, in my opinion, would be inadequate. On the other hand, if I had a patient who came in, very diseased frontal recess, very diseased frontal sinus, several previous surgeries, absolutely, I would go and do a draft three on a case like that. But it, you really have to push me to do a draft three. So when you do a perfect primary surgery and it fails, I want you to sit down and question yourself. Have you missed immunodeficiency? Have you missed uh, uh, an autoimmune disease? Have you missed something wrong with the mucous membrane? Have you missed a ciliary dysfunction? Why is it failing? Is it just one sinus that's failing versus the whole cavity? If it's just one sinus, it's very likely that there is something that you've missed. If it's a whole cavity, very likely that something is wrong with the physiology and more surgery won't help. Will stripping all the mucous membrane help? I don't know. Uh, is it something I've done? Yes, I've done it on a few patients, less than five. Uh, did it work? Yes, actually it did work on one or two patients, but not all of them. But I only did it when everything else had failed and nothing was helping. And I showed you those pictures of those Manuka honey patients. They responded. I didn't expect them to respond. That is a patient that I wanted to take back to surgery and they, they didn't need surgery. So I always stop myself from going into further surgery and figuring out, well, I did a good surgery. Why did this patient fail? Like that very first video I showed you on the presentation, where we found that thick biofilm inner sinuses, how many of you would do a mega enterostomy on that patient? How many of you would do more surgery on that patient? Do you think a mega enterostomy and a draft three and stripping of that mucous membrane will cure that patient? I don't know. I cured that patient using topical management and PDT. She got completely cured uh, using those treatments. Maybe the rest of the world doesn't have treatments like that. And maybe why, that's why they're um, ripping mucous membrane and making mega enterostomies and doing draft trays. I don't know. I don't know the answer. I am just very reluctant to do that. How long and frequency of topical treatments um, from Dr. Algarazi? Great question. Um, so I will continue in an AFS patient tropical treatments lifelong, okay? Uh, Budesonide treatment for lifelong. Um, if you've read our papers, you know that every two years we'll do, um, we'll do a bone density test on these patients. We'll do a cosentropin uh, ad adrenaline uh, test to make sure they don't have a HPA axis suppression. Uh, and uh, we will do a bone density test on these patients. If it's a patient with uh, chronic biofilm, uh, I will start them on both uh, beta DNA irrigations uh, and palmicot irrigations. One is for inflammation, one is to reduce uh, bacterial load. Uh, once they, and then I'll watch them. I'll see them every six to eight weeks, scope them. And once their sinuses uh, get deflamed, infection disappears, then I'll slowly taper them off the topical treatments and I'm trying to get the microbiome to reestablish itself. So I reduce one and allow the other to come in. And I would say in about 80% of patients, I can, within a couple of years, stop the topical treatments, except for AFS patients. Everybody else, I can stop the topical treatments and get their microbiomes in good shape. Irrigation with honey, olive oil, and normal saline as a mixture. I have never used olive oil in the sinuses. I have used sesame seed oil for, for um, dryness. Um, oil in the sinuses worries me a tiny bit as an irrigant, only because oil can be a bit um, hard on the respiratory system in case it goes into the lungs. Um, so I avoid using oil in the rinse, um, things like olive oil. Um, Tell me about your experience. I'd love to hear about your experience. I've never tried it. Uh, I've never read a study on olive oil rinses. Um, I think I would be a bit worried. Um, I would like to try it in animal studies first before using it in humans, but I have no experience with that. What does nasal mucosal memory mean and its rule of and its rule of revision sinus surgery? And its rule of revision sinus surgery. Um, so I think in my, in my mind, um, I don't think that mucous membrane, uh, or the mucosa has a memory. I, 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 
I think that's the fit. I think what you're referring to and what people mean when they say that is they mean that the mucous membrane has a particular physiology, that there's something wrong with the physiology. Um, I believe that there is something wrong that we can't find. Um, and no matter how hard we treat that patient, they keep reverting back to being bad. Um, I have found that patients who refer to me as recalcitrant, I do an IgG subclass and I find an IgG deficiency. And I give them IVIG and these patients get better. Um, but if you didn't do that, then you would think, huh, why is this patient not getting better? Maybe there is some sort of a memory uh, in the nasal mucosa. I don't know. I don't know if the nasal mucosa has a memory. I think there is something deficient that we're just not finding the key to. Once we find that key, the patients all of a sudden get better. I don't know. I don't know the answer to your question completely. Okay, so this is a good question. Um, the question is, what is optimal medical therapy uh, or medic maximal medical management? Um, and what I use, and I, I, I don't think, um, I don't think that the words maximal medical therapy are good, um, because I think optimal medical therapy is much better. So if I had a patient um, that came in uh, with pus dripping out of their sinuses, um, inflammation of the mucous membrane, uh, and I cultured them, and uh, they grew pseudomonas. Um, and they had um, asthma, um, the treatment would be different than if somebody came in with mucin in their sinuses and asthma. The, the treatment would be different. So the, the mucinous patient uh, who grows uh, fungus out of their sinuses, and I'm going to treat them with optical medical management, I would use, uh, for sure, I would use uh, budesonide topically. I may use itraconazole um, orally. I may use, um, of course, all of them will go to the asthma doctor and get asthma therapy instituted right away. Uh, I may use Montelukast um, together with the itraconazole because we have seen a synergistic effect. Um, I would not use an antibiotic in that patient. On the other hand, in that first patient with the pseudomonas that was sensitive, let's say, to um, Cipro and gentamicin, I might use a gentamicin nasal irrigation, uh, oral Cipro, uh, start asthma medications, uh, start topical uh, budesonide treatments. So very different treatments uh, in two patients who may present to me in a very similar way. So I think the key word in your, in your question is optimum. It has to be optimum uh, treatment, not maximal treatment. Um, and so it varies between patients. And Osmia, um, in the era of COVID, um, I think that's a great question. Um, so in the era of COVID, somebody showing up with anosmia, uh, you have to question COVID because especially uh, if you're living in an environment where COVID is rampant, uh, I don't know how many positive cases you have in the part of the world where you live. Um, but if a patient came in with a new onset anosmia or hyposmia, uh, you have to be very careful because that can be the very first symptom that they can, and the only symptom that they can have. So um, first of all, uh, you must protect yourself and make sure that you don't uh, get the COVID from the patient. Um, I think I would do a COVID test on that patient almost right away before I treat that patient uh, in any way with topical steroids or oral steroids, um, because I don't know how that's gonna affect uh, their disease progression over time. Uh, I would start them on baited in uh, rinses or baited in gel spray uh, to try and potentially reduce COVID load in their sinuses. I mean, if you were living in the US right now uh, with the amount of COVID in the US, I think I would be very careful uh, with a new patient who presents with anosmia here uh, in Vancouver, uh, where um, yesterday we only had four positive tested in the entire province of 5 million. 
uh, I think the chances of me having a COVID positive patient walk into my office is virtually zero until we open the US borders and open the airport because we are pretty isolated um, as a province right now. So I think you have to be very careful. And I think, I hope you are careful when you're dealing with these patients in clinic and in the OR. New treatments for anosmia. Yes, there are some great um, new treatments for anosmia. Um, and let's talk anosmia without COVID. I'm hoping that's your question. Um, the, the best S treatment for anosmia is um, olfactory retraining therapy. Very good success rates. So please use it. It works. 70% of our patients get their um, smell back with, um, with uh, uh, olfactory retraining therapy. Uh, and then uh, a lot of our patients have very good response to vitamin A, uh, topical vitamin A. So we give them a vitamin A spray that they'll um, use an MAD syringe um, with their head hanging over the edge of the bed and they'll spray it right into their olfactory clefts. Um, and we have had um, success rates in the range of 80 to 90% in this when we combine um, olfactory retraining therapy with topical vitamin A therapy. So th that would be... I'm not sure if that's new to you because I've spoken about it before and it's been, I think, recently published, but there are trials going on. We are actually involved in a trial with groups in England and in Germany uh, with vitamin A sprays and olfactory training therapy. Is recalcitrant CRS only mucosal disease or underlying osteitis? Um, great question. I mean, uh, you know that David Kennedy uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s talked about underlying osteitis uh, as a cause for recalcitrant CRS. Uh, when you see patients with recalcitrant CRS, where you do see the osteitis um, and you do see the recalcitrant sinusitis. Um, I would think that in my mind, that seems pretty obvious that uh, when you have chronic inflammation in the mucous um, membrane, that inflammation is going to recur or occur in the bone right underneath it. So when you see a chronic sinus patient with recalcitrance, you see that all that bone around that sinus has become thickened. And when you treat them and they get better, and years later, that osteitis actually disappears. Um, so I don't do anything special for the bone. I don't take the mucous membrane off and drill down the bone and put the mucous membrane back on. I don't think that the osteitis is causing the recalcitrant sinusitis, but this is my thought. There is no evidence behind my thought. It's just my thinking. And I feel that it's the other way around, that the mucosal inflammation is causing inflammation in the bone. Just my thought. And when I have been able to reduce the inflammation in the mucous membrane, the inflammation in the bone disappears. I do not have any experience or have not read uh, enough data to show that removing that underlying inflammation in the bone fixes their mucous membrane. But I've seen the other way around. So I think I think that the mucous membrane is the problem, not the bone. Great discussion, great questions. So thanks for you again, uh, Professor Amin, for your time with us. And uh, you, if you have a time to answer uh, the rest of questions uh, 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 on the on the Facebook uh, comments, and mm -hmm. I will also mention you in the in the Facebook uh, video. Uh, sure. So thank you, again. and uh, you can. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Javer, just uh, for your knowledge and for your uh, presentation as well. And we uh, we are looking forward to your next presentation about the front sinus mm -hmm. you promised us with. Uh, I'd be happy uh, to. Yeah, and we are really happy also to declare that uh, our YouTube channel has reached the first 1,000 subscribers today. So we hope that uh, it will grow more and more and with your help as well and with the valuable presentation that we have got. Thank Inshallah. You. You're welcome. Take care. Have a good, good night, guys. Bye now. Okay, thank you, Prof. Sarmin. Okay. Bye-bye.